Welcome to Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm Wales Brown, and today we're talking to Stephanie Kruger, who is a librarian and consultant working mostly in Prague in the Czech Republic, on the topic, Extreme Politics Harms Science. Now, Stephanie, you are a, let's say, a scientific and technological librarian and information specialist, and, and you're interested in making the results of scientific work accessible, e yes. even internationally. Yes. Could you say something about what you do and how you got into doing that? I currently work with multiple institutions in Prague, uh, working with K through 12 students all the way up to postdocs as a librarian and as a member of uh, research groups. Uh, so I have a unique perspective in that I see the spectrum of impact of politics on uh, students in STEM fields um, from you know, sixth grade all the way up to their forties. And what I'm witnessing through my work is uh, endemic problems in, many areas with the influence of right-wing politics hitting uh, students at multiple levels uh, of their educations. And you've seen this in the Czech Republic, but that's not an extreme case. That uh, You've seen similar things in other countries too in your work. This is correct. I work with a research scientists in Croatia, for example. I see similar effects. I recently have worked with colleagues in Slovakia, mm -hmm. scientists, but also in social sciences and humanities fields, I see the same exact effects, also the same kinds of messaging that we'll probably get to later in the interview. And I work with uh, IFLA, an International Library Association Resource Sharing and Document Delivery Committee, and we are globally seeing effects across, across the world, um, from Turkey to Brazil to the United States to Canada. So we are seeing similar messaging, similar uh, tactics being used in multiple countries. And so we're seeing an endemic problem, I would say, in terms of uh, extreme politics influencing the educational sphere. All right, so can we say something about how education in scientific fields ought to work and, and how far it is working that way. <laughs> uh, um, I guess ideally every school child should have some exposure uh, to, to the results of scientific research, whether or not the, the child is, uh, is going to go into science uh, um, and contribute to it. Right, but at this time, um, there's a very confusing information space. Um, a lot of the scientific results and the scientific information is gated be behind walls that are institutionally guarded. Uh, in the United States, you see that the public libraries often offer access to scientific databases, but a lot of the smaller community libraries, uh, to use an American example, are not able to provide access fully to the very expensive scientific databases. Um, these are multi-million dollar uh, initiatives that you know, a small public library might not be able to access. So what happens is in the information space, you have, um, let's take a, in the elementary school, secondary school level, you have teachers and children unable to access scientific results easily, unless they're high school or, uh, community subscribes to these resources. What that means is that many teachers and students end up finding the openly available information sources, often on sources like TikTok, YouTube, and other uh, places, 
um, that are infiltrated by right wing <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. players. For a good example would be in terms of COVID misinformation, um, there are some really high profile videos that hit the YouTube space um, that are anti-science in, in many ways. And um, many of my students, uh, if they don't have access to the scientific results, their view of the world is skewed because they have access to these openly available right-wing for example, resources, and not the solid scientific results unless they know about them. So access to the scientific results. And, um, when you say database, I think of a, a collection of all the issues uh, of a journal on biology or a journal on, on chemistry. And, and uh, um, here in Ithaca, people can use the, the Cornell University Library and uh, and see a chemistry journal from 2021 or a chemistry journal from 1956 and, and find an article on, on something if they know what they're looking for. Exactly. Um, but in many places, it's not the case. And in the Czech Republic, for example, we have a really robust information infrastructure at the university level. Um, but many students and teachers are not even aware of this infrastructure because we're lacking what's called information literacy instruction at the K through 12 level. So one thing in my work as a librarian at the Czech National Library of Technology that we're trying to do uh, is to extend access to these uh, scientific journals to the K through 12 level. And we're doing a lot of work with high school teachers to start earlier in the educational process so that people become more information or media literate, so to speak, earlier before, so that they even understand what's available to them. Because as it stands without that work, oftentimes they're not even aware that they might have access to the scientific journals. And that's in a somewhat wealthy country like the Czech Republic, where there is access to these scientific mm -hmm. journals, either the current ones or the back issues. But you can imagine in places uh, even next door to the Czech Republic in Slovakia, many of the universities don't even have access to the most recent scientific journals. So there are gaps in the, in the record. And one must remember a lot of that record currently is in English. So in addition to all of that, you have a language barrier uh, for people who are not fluent in English. So it can be difficult for them when we get down mm -hmm. to, let's say, the general public, to even understand the information that they might have access to because of these language issues. Okay, so most journals are published in English nowadays. In science. So, uh, in science. In science, <laughs> yes. And <laughs> and be, engineering. <laughs> it used to be that, uh, well, centuries ago, most science was published in Latin. Or German, and, French. Or German. <laughs> A, a lot of engineering in French in previous centuries, and, and yes. certainly chemistry was in German, and yes. American chemists had to learn to read German to find out about organic chemistry. And the, uh, but nowadays English seems to be the most fashionable. But another, exactly. th another thing is that publishers of journals charge a lot to subscribe to. This is true. And uh, the prices are increasing every single year. And so libraries and universities uh, are having to find new sources of funding to even gain access to the journals over time. So there is an open access and open journal movement that librarians have been active in for many mm -hmm. years, uh, many institutions as well. But we're in a situation in which it's not fully realized this vision of open access to all. So you have this hybrid environment in which there are these very expensive gated journals that are more and more expensive every year. And people have to make hard choices about what they even subscribe to, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in, you know, let's say chemistry, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is uh, notoriously proprietary uh, mm -hmm. for many reasons. Um, and then you have open access advocates, you have open access materials. They are oftentimes reliable, but there is also a problem in the open access sphere of what's called predatory journals and players that are trying to skew the open access environment. So we've seen, for example, in COVID, there are 
players, misinformation players who are publishing what looks like a scientific journal or in the open access environment because they know that it's accessible to many people. And so you have these the skewed access environment where it's a patchwork and it's even difficult for many scientists themselves to figure out this environment. So you can imagine for members of the general public how difficult it can be to navigate um, what they're seeing online. One type of publisher says to, to prospective authors, you pay us money and yep. we'll include your article in our journal. Right. And those fees can be very high. You know, there mm. fees in the scientific uh, sphere, the fees for open access publication can be upwards to $3,000 or more, which means the wealthy institutions can pay for that. It's not a problem for the Mm well-funded research groups, but for uh, researchers in, let's say, Africa, even in the Czech Republic, Mm -hmm. um, they will not, they don't have the funding, they don't have the access to the money to pay for the open access Uh, journal publication. So even if they'd like to, they might not be able to afford the open access publishing on these big database platforms that are run by commercial entities. Uh, There seems to be a fairly small number of of publishing companies that put out journals. A lot of them are in the Netherlands for some reason. Yes. So Elsevier uh, is the famous example. You have Springer, um, which Mm -hmm. is German, German. European based. Mm -hmm. Plus you have the American publishers, American Chemical Society uh, and so on. Some are nonprofits, but these Mm -hmm. bigger players like Elsevier are for profit organizations Mm -hmm. um, that are making profits on the scientific output, um, you know, everything that is mm-hmm. submitted to them, they are making uh, huge profits. And you're seeing actual, within the database realm, a lot of consolidation as well. So you're seeing a smaller and smaller number of players in the commercial side of scientific publishing every year. So you're seeing big conglomerates and even uh, financial trading units starting to buy into the control. For example, Web of Science, Uh, that Mm -hmm. some of your listeners may be familiar with was bought a few years ago by a giant financial organization called Clarivate. And Mm -hmm. they have nothing to do with the academic endeavor. And most people don't even know about this. They just see web of science, but behind the scenes, you have a big conglomerate. And when we talk about extreme politics, no one knows who owns that environment, that conglomerate. You can look it up you can, you, you are able to find out who owns it, but just imagine a world in which a Mercer family or some kind of extreme um, political player gains control over these scientific databases, you could end up seeing a lot of skew of actually what people are seeing, even well-trained scientists. In the yeah, future. there's a small side issue, which is that people who are already at universities get judged and evaluated by how many of their articles, not just how many of their articles get published, but how many of their articles get published in journals that are listed in Web of Science. And Scopus, which is Elsevier. Yeah, so, but um, getting back a bit to the distribution of scientific knowledge, ideally every school child should know something about chemistry, but also yes. know a little bit about how the news about chemistry gets spread around the world and how to get access to it. Exactly. And that is kind of the, the place, the starting place that I think, you know, in the next 10 years that librarians and anyone who's uh, interested in information and media literacy should start, starting at the K through 12 level and giving students basic searching skills for searching internet databases. How do scientific journals work? What are scientific results um, getting to the harder scientific side? Uh, You know, what is the scientific method? What is argumentation? Um, These are, you know, really starting uh, to formulate what it gets, it it delves a little bit into philosophy, uh, but Mm -hmm. really um, how can people critically view the arguments that they're seeing? Because of course, a lot of these extreme players want a populace that isn't thinking about the information that they're seeing because they're easily skewed. So the sooner we could have, in my opinion, children learning about how 
arguments are coming at them, how to make counter arguments, how to filter the information that's coming to them. They would have lifelong skills that they could more easily enter the world as adults and be able to critically view the information they're seeing and make more informed decisions. Then they would maybe have some skills. Some people liken it to vaccination. There would Mm -hmm. be some media skills that they would then be able to withstand a lot of the misinformation that comes their way later in life. Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's not happening despite many committed players at a large scale around the world. And it's a, a, I think, bigger and bigger problem every day. Well, you yourself as a librarian, have been doing some outreach to schools be, yes. below the university level. And I say, yes. I say that's wonderful, more power to you. But what have you noticed uh, in, in the way uh, of attempted political influence against this? What um, have politicians been, been looking at schools and saying, no, don't teach this, don't, uh, don't expose children to this? And, Yes, I've heard incidences of that in uh, uh, certain American states. In the Czech Republic, it's very interesting because there were political actors who were against this. Let's say they were uh, populist actors. Mm -hmm. Um, The former president, uh, or still president in some ways, (laughs) uh, was uh, not implementing European Union media and information literacy standards at the Czech national level and not stopping it completely, but slowing down the process of even educating teachers about new trends, things like that. Our library wasn't influenced directly by this, but the schools definitely were because the teachers were were not given the information that would have made, let's say, their life easier in teaching these subjects. We see now, let's take the Czech Republic as an example, with the war in Ukraine, uh, acute political problems. So this is maybe a positive example. The Czech government is now more interested in media literacy because they're seeing the infiltration of Russian trolls into the information sphere. So they're actively tracking the misinformation that's coming in, trying to set up some kind of blockades that many people don't even, who knows, Mm -hmm. in the governmental national level. So you're seeing more support against these kind of infiltrations against certain players. Um, That's something that we've seen over the years in the United States too. That uh, there have been overt Russian-oriented uh, sources of news like RT, um, yes. and and then there have been trolls uh, uh, putting comments on websites yes. that overtly or covertly f- favor the Russian point of view or or. Uh, uh, denigrate some other point of view. And the- exactly. So we're seeing those kind of effects. And, um, you know, throughout COVID, for example, we were seeing, you know, direct misinformation attacks. And what was interesting to me is that working in a multilingual setting is you would see messages that I would hear from the United States from <laughs> friends that are combating that kind of misinformation, translated into Czech, into Slovak, into German, into Croatian. Uh, Bosnian Serbo creation. So you would mm-hmm. see the same exact message translated into the different national spheres. It was very, very interesting because you could really see the pattern. I wasn't able to perform a study about this because of, I didn't have time to do formal mm-hmm. research project, but that would be a really interesting course of study is to across the national, you know, national players track how they are translating the messages and and making the messages go worldwide. Um, to track the trolls. Who, who track is the trans- trolls. <laughs> who is translating the, uh, the, uh, their um, mischievous messages? Yeah. Exactly. Someone is doing it. Um, and who is that? Who? I think it's multiple players. I don't think it's just one. I, I think for different issues, there are. Um, there are multiple players, and they're much more organized <laughs> and much more. Um, I would say they're definitely more organized than, let's say, the left, in my opinion, you know, or the, mm-hmm. the people who are fight, fighting misinformation. We're, we're still not organized, at least in a Czech Republic, in any, any way that I can see. Um, we should be more organized ourselves. In, in the United it. States, we've been seeing uh, religious groups and organizations yes. 
uh, spreading misinformation yes. and trying to counteract real information. Does that happen in European countries in, in the same way? It does. We're starting to see um, the undergraduate students uh, for the past three to four years. We've been seeing even uh, undergraduate students of science, let's say in biology, who are anti-evolution, um, who do not believe in Darwin and who will, as a specific mm. example, and if you introduce those topics, even in the scientific classroom, they will combat that with religious messaging. So yes, it's happening in Europe. That's and, uh, ironic when you think about the Czech Republic, be, be, I mean, because Gregor yes. Mendel, <laughs> uh, they, uh, who uh, first worked out the laws of heredity, worked in Brno. And yes. you, 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 you could take kids to Brno to see the Gregor Mendel Museum. Yes. And so it's, it, you are seeing all these really strange uh, effects happening, uh, really. And you, yes, and talking to you just can't believe it because they are learning about Mendel in, you know, in school. Mm -hmm. um, they know he's a figure. Maybe they have some, you know, instruction at the K through 12 level, but then they come to the university level and they're spouting these kind of, you know, in Czech Republic is one of the most atheist countries in the world, but you are seeing infiltrations by different religious players. I would say also major organized religions are starting mm -hmm. to try to make inroads at this point in time. And you see it a lot also, um, you know, in the discussions about, I'm sure you see this in the US about public education. So you're starting to see kind of the uh, charter schools, the private schools and the, you know, a lot of religious undertones there. You know, there might be a private school pop-up that might have a religious backer, for example. Um, and who knows what goes, in, goes on in those classrooms. You know? Are there private universities showing up there too? There's there certainly are. are in the US. And the... There are, but we're not seeing mm. those big religious, you know, like um, mm. Hillsdale College. <laughs> we're not seeing that in a Czech Republic yet. And the Ministry of Education uh, so far has pretty strict accreditation standards for new universities um, and new colleges. So we're not seeing that. But of course, there's the famous Hungarian example with the open university in Budapest being closed <laughs> for political <laughs> reason by, <laughs> by Orban, you know, the extreme populist. Yeah, there's an, an irony in that too, because the, uh, the funds for the open university were, were given by George Soros. Yes. Who was a Hungarian originally. Yes. And uh, moved to New York, became rich in, in financial trading and decided to do good things with his wealth. Yes. And, and one of the good things he did was to fund a scholarship for the young student, Viktor Orban, to go to London and study. <laughs> uh, but Mr. Orban has shown himself to be ungrateful since then. Exactly. So, and, and the, the Soros conspiracy theories are uh, very popular in Europe across the national boundaries. So one common thing you hear from people is, is uh, how Soros is just, uh, uh, you know, well, a lot of it does relate back to the old anti-Jewish themes as well. So they've kind of combined the anti-Semitism with uh, Soros hatred and, uh, you know, you you just hear he's trying to take over the world and he secretly con controls the world behind the scenes, that kind of, you know, common message <laughs> from the ages, you know. I, I, that certainly has been around in Hungary and, and the university has mostly had to move to Vienna in Austria. There, there, there are still some institutions in, yes. in Budapest where, where they started. Yes. Oh, well, let's see, summing up a bit, what can we say about uh, um, international cooperation in science and how there should be more of it and how, should the, how there should be less interference from politics? But... Yes, I think, it, I, I think that, um, you know, the scholarly societies, uh, my personal feeling that let's take science, that, we were, mm -hmm. that was our topic for today. I think the international scholarly societies should uh, because they are already are globally organized, should really uh, take an interest in these access issues to a level they currently are not. As you said, because of those uh, tenure and promotion <laughs> kind mm -hmm. of realities of day-to-day -day life, um, 
it makes it sometimes difficult, but there are organizations like the International Librarian Association that I'm a part of that we're trying to bridge these boundaries and address these issues on a global scale. Um, but there needs to be a lot more work done by the scholarly societies in the different disciplines and figuring out the access to database, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. issues, uh, not just at the institutional level, but at the international level. So I dream sometimes of a international funding organism <laughs> mechanism mm -hmm. for maintaining these scientific platforms that is independent of the national and local institutional funding, but that is somehow resilient to influence from political players. Uh, that's a big vision and I don't think that that's realistic even within my lifetime, but I think that there are people trying to work slowly towards that. Um, oh, yeah. the, the European Union might be the best place to try to get that started. Yes. Uh, at present, uh, I think most scientific societies are nationwide. Uh, yes. uh, 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 there's the Royal Society in the United yes. Kingdom. Yes. Uh, uh, there are a couple of academies of science in the United States. There's the Czech Academy of Sciences. Exactly. Uh, so uh, like at the, there would be, if the, those organizations could work at the regional level in the European Union mm -hmm. or and then at the cross-regional level, that would be a great starting place. And they've been cooperating in the sense that they send their publications to each other. So exactly. I, can, I can find Czech scientific publications in my university library and vice yes. versa, I, I hope. Uh, yes. But I can see that we need to, to do much more in international cooperation and in cooperation between university and academy level work and schools at all levels. Yes, and that's and, the other thing that we're trying to do is really make those connections more deeply into the schools. You know, with the research group members, uh, mm -hmm. for example, I work with a research group member who goes into the, consciously into the public schools because he's so worried about this issue. And it's in his interest because he's interest, he would like to have good students in the future. So his engagement at that level does make sense directly for him in gaining better students in the long term. Okay, I think that's the message we should leave our listeners with. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Stephanie, for talking to us today. This has been Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm Wales Brown. We'll see you again in the next program. One, two, one, two, three.